Welcome back. We're going to try and answer some of the questions that have come up during the live show about the Lumix G9 and its autofocus continuous capabilities. Welcome back, everybody. So now we're going to do a little Q&A, whatever you guys want to ask. You know, it doesn't have to just be about the G9. You can ask anything you want. I know it's been a long time since we've done any Q&A. So this could be a five-minute show. This could, in, could turn into a very long show. I don't know. I don't even know what my time, my next out is. I think I think I got some time here. So let's see if we can answer some questions. Uh, let me grab my mouse here so I can see the comments. Let me just get this thing out of the way. And let's see what we've got. So Ben5 asks, since the G9 was announced, I'm in a dilemma as to what to buy first, GH5 or G9. I had set my heart on the GH5, so you have the best of both worlds, but you like the specs of the G9. No doubt, that is going to be a tough question for a lot of people. Uh, and now, of course, with the GH5S, it's even a third level dilemma, but I think that's a little bit easier because that's a pretty specific camera do doing pretty specific things. So between the GH5 and the G9, Keep in mind that when it comes to still photography, the G9 is, it clearly has the upper edge, especially for the high speed. Um, you've got the, the high resolution panorama, uh, high resolution stitching feature in there. So if you're really primarily a stills photographer, the G9 is likely the camera to go with. If you're primarily a video photographer or videographer, then the GH5 is likely the one to go with. If you're balancing both worlds, then obviously it's a little bit harder decision to make. The, so G9, big advantages, you've got that higher speed, frame, higher frame rate, higher frames per second. You've got the stitching mode. Um, you've got a few, a little bit faster autofocus for still photography. Uh, a few other things that I'm forgetting right now, but in general, clearly focus on the still. When it comes to video, the GH5 has several advantages. One of the biggies, well, let's see, three biggies that are just jumping to my head right now. You've got the unlimited recording time. So if you're doing video all the time, that's kind of important. You've got PAL and NTSC and True24 Cinema built into one body, whereas this you have to buy either PAL or NTSC. So if you're bouncing around regions, that might be something of importance to you. Uh, the other is that the GH5 will do the will do a higher quality video recording at the higher end. It does the 10-bit uh, all intra frame recording, which this camera does not. If I'm just pulling up the recording specs on this to make sure that I'm I don't misquote anything. Um, so yeah, we've got on here in 4K, you've got your yeah, 4208 bit and in 4K and 60p, same thing, 4208 bit, 150 megabit and 100 megabit. On the GH5, you get that all intra, you get 60p, you get 10 bit, you get a lot more capabilities on the higher end of video. So if your, your main bag is doing the high end video work, then the GH5 is still the camera for you. Uh, if those really high-end video features are kind of, oh, that'd be nice to have, but I don't really need them, then the G9 is probably more in line. The G9, it also costs less, right? So even if uh, even if you're shooting video, but you're not so concerned about those high-end features, the G9 does cost, what, $500 less or something, $400 less. So it's definitely definitely worth uh, considering for that. So that's, that's the easy comparison there. Um, other than that, of course, there's a lot of little things that you'll want to compare side by side, but those are the easy big ones that we, uh, we can look at. Okay, let's see what else is going on here in the comments. Uh, Brent says, can we ask about GH5S? Go right ahead. When might we be getting the GH5S? I don't know what the shipping date was. I'm sure it was announced. Was it next month? I think it's not that far away. End of this month, early next month, something like that. Yeah, it's, I think it's not too far away. Ben5 says, when I tested the pre-production sample G9, I didn't like the hair shutter button. Okay, so that's, you experienced that as well. Hope it's gone to the proper production model. Now, okay, so he's talking about in the previous show, I was mentioning how when you touch the shutter, it's very easy to trigger it. it kind of a hair trigger. I would say that now that I've had it, just a, even just shot with it a little bit, I'm used to it and I don't accidentally trigger it anymore. When I first started working with it, absolutely, I was accidentally triggering it all the time. Now that I've worked with it a little bit, it's not an issue, but uh, you know, your mileage may vary. But I don't know if that's changing or not in the hardware. If, you're, if you saw it on your hardware pre-production model two that you played with, then that likely is a hardware design. It's just designed to be a more hair trigger. So, uh, well, we'll see. Like I said, you get used to it. I, I've gotten used to it on mine, no problem. Brent asked, does the G9 have the same time-lapse stop animation features as the GH5? Yeah, pretty uh, pretty much all the Lumix cameras have those, actually. That's not unique to this higher-end cameras. The ability to do time-lapse, built-in time-lapse, built-in stop motion with the kind of overlay, the onion skinny overlay, that's in pretty much all of the Lumix cameras. So, yeah, that's not anything uh, unique to GH5. 
Rich says, do you think if you put a pic from the G9 up against a full frame camera, would most, if anybody, be able to tell the difference? That's a fair question. Oh, and Tom is saying February 1st for the, um, for the G9, a uh, GH5S, thank you. So Rich, great question. Uh, would you be able to tell a difference? I think that it's gonna depend on, it's gonna depend on a lot of situations. All right, okay, any, the lower light you go, higher ISO you go, generally the larger sensor is going to have an advantage, less noise. This is why, exactly why, the GH5S has a lower resolution sensor so that it's got bigger pixels, so it has better low light gathering capability. So G9 versus full frame, if you go into super low light, the full frame is likely to perform better at really, really high ISO. That's just physics, so there's, there is that to consider. One of the big things that people tell, call the difference on is bokeh. Now, if you have a, uh, what a 50 millimeter f2 lens on a Canon full frame and you've got a, well, 25 millimeter would be the 50 mil equivalent f2 lens on this camera, then yes, you're going to see a depth of field difference because you want that, sh that f2 is not the equivalent on the micro four thirds. It's not the equivalent shallow depth of field. So you would want to go to f1.4. I think that's the right math. I think that's the right math. f1.4 lens would give you that same shallow depth of field. If, assuming that you get an equivalent aperture once converted to full frame, equivalent aperture, equivalent focal length, and you put them side by side, there, the differences, I mean, you're going to be really picking nits to try and find any differences there. Uh, I, when I switched over to Micro Four Thirds, when I first switched, I felt, and I did a lot of side by sides because it surprised me so much, my images were sharper coming out, and this is years ago, were sharper. And then, let's see, this would have been an Olympus. OMD, EM, you know, whatever it was that was out like five or six years ago, compared to a Canon 5D Mark II, because that's what I was shooting at the time. And I had felt that my Canon images were looking soft when compared to the, the Micro Four Thirds, which really blew me away because of the smaller sensor. My previous life, I was a full frame snob. There's no question about it. So when I switched over, I was really surprised at the quality. And I've done a whole video about my whole transition process. If you haven't seen that, We'll link to that up here because it's kind of cool and fun. Um, and and uh, anyway, like I said, the quality, the image quality, the sharpness was just absolutely there. So I don't know, that's kind of a roundabout answer to your question. It's going to depend on what you're comparing, but there are definitely differences and there are advantages and disadvantages to both. But uh, I think for most people, you know, I can be able to tell the difference. Equivalent lens and focal length uh, setup. Okay, uh, next up. Brent is asking when I will get a GH5S. I don't know. I believe soon, but I don't know. We'll leave it at that. Hopefully soon, because I've got some, I've got some stuff planned to shoot. Uh, all right, let's see here. Anything else? Oh, that's it. Uh, oh, here we go. Uh, Piotr Placetta. Cool. I don't think I've seen you in here before. Greetings from Warsaw, Poland. Poland. Excellent. I've never been to Warsaw. Tragedy, I've got to fix that. The question is, what are your thoughts regarding free software for photos editing, for example, GIMP or RAW Therapy? I'm not familiar with RAW Therapy. I have played with GIMP once years ago. Uh, you, uh, <laughs> spend 10 bucks a month to get Lightroom? <laughs> that's, my, that's my thoughts on that. Those apps are using open source RAW Decoder, which is actually pretty good. Uh, I've seen some pretty good results out of open source RAW Decoders. I have, however, seen not as good results off of those open source raw decoders for Micro Four Thirds, specifically for Lumix cameras at least, because that's what I've looked at, because I think they're not as, as popular as the Canon and Nikon cameras, so maybe there's not as many people contributing to the code to make it better. But I've also seen support, raw support come in for new cameras long before they've hit the market, which is pretty cool. Somebody got their hands on a file and did whatever it is they do and, and made the, the code for it. So that part of it's awesome. But in general, I find from what I've seen, the quality, while not bad from the open source, is better from Adobe or from Apple or, or Capture One, right? They're, those guys, that's what they do, man. They, you know, they do a really good job of building in the raw decoder. So image quality is going to be better with those. And then as far as things like asset management and image adjustment tools, it's really hard to argue with 10 bucks a month. I know a lot of people don't like the subscription plan of Lightroom. They don't like having to pay continuously, but Honestly, 10 bucks a month, it's a bargain. You're getting a really, really great tool. And if you're not looking for such a high-end tool, of course, you've got Photos. If you're, if you're working on a Mac, you've got Apple Photos, which is getting better all the time and is a really good tool as well. In fact, I'm doing a whole training course on that right now. So, which actually it's, you know, I should probably not, I keep forgetting to plug my stuff. So this is what happens. I go away for too long, I start 
forgetting to plug my things. Um, I just did a photos training session 1501 yesterday. I'm sneaking in an extra 1501A. We're talking about importing and organizing still, but this time we're going to focus specifically on iOS, and that is going to be later on today. It might actually be like in an hour. I think that might be. It's coming up soon. So that's that's happening. Uh, anyway, so photos is is getting better and it's pretty solid. It's a pretty good app. And it does have very good raw decoding because it's using what's built into Mac OS. So anyway, kind of a roundabout answer, but uh, and I don't have a whole lot of experience with them, but with what little I do, the raw decoding, while it works, is not as good as what you get out of Adobe or Apple or Capture One, Image One, Capture One, Image One. Okay, next up, uh, anything else? Let's see here, scroll to comments and... Product mm, Interna, hello again, says technically the GH5S gets a slight bump in background blur since it is a bigger sensor and wider, wider focal length compared to the GH5. Mm, I guess that's true because it is then scaling the image down a slight bit. That's interesting. That is interesting. But like you said, slight, very slight, because it is a bigger sensor, slightly bigger sensor. Huh, I hadn't thought of that. Interesting, very interesting, yeah, possibly. He also says, I've tested the GH5S. You have. I don't even have one. And the extra wide angle is awesome. Seven millimeter compared to the GH5 gets you really wide shots. Sorry for off topic. Let's hear more about the G9. No, no, it's today. We're on any topic right now. It's fine. Um, interesting. Well, that is very interesting. Cool. I hadn't seen that. Marvin says, when are you going back to Affinity? I wrapped up Affinity. I wrapped it up for what I was going to do with it. Um, I won't come back to it until there's another major version on it. I kind of wrapped up what I wanted to wrap up on there. So um, that's that for Affinity. And... I guess that's it. Oh, Willie says, I found your channel when I was looking to get rid of Canon gear and go Panasonic. Well done on the channel. Thank you very much. Keep up the good work. I'll keep trying. From a new G85 phot photographer owner. Awesome. G85, great camera. Very good camera. Thank you for tuning in. All right, JG says, DP Review is saying the G9 focus point dial is very slow. Focus point dial is slow. I don't know. I use the joystick to move the focus point around. So, um, I don't know. And this is, okay. I'm going to have a little, a little mini rant here. This applies to the G9. This applies to GH5S. This applies to any review that you see from DP Review or anybody else out there, me included, talking about pre-production cameras. What I have right now in my hands is a version 0.3 of the firmware. Version 1's been out for a little while. I just got it. What any of these vloggers, reviewers, whatever you're seeing out there right now before the camera shipping have in their hands is pre-production. Anybody who doesn't point out, hey, I'm working with pre-production firmware so it might get better, is doing a disservice to their customer, to their channel, and to Panasonic. It's not fair. They're given early access to work with something and they should be under kind of a strict rule to say, look, if you're gonna talk about the camera, we're gonna give it to you early, but you gotta point out this is pre-production. Things can change. Software changes. So if they're seeing things like moving the cursor around is too slow, feed that back to Panasonic. Panasonic might say, oh, thanks for the feedback. Or they might say, yeah, it's a known bug. But telling a customer, oh, it's too slow, or anything, oh, this camera doesn't do this, doesn't do that, it's a piece of crap, is really frustrating because the firmware isn't done. So end of rant, just keep in mind when you're watching anything about pre-production, it's pre-production, things change. And even after it starts shipping, Camera manufacturers like Panasonic keep on shipping updates as we've seen all the way up to version two of the firmware for the GH5. So that's that. Okay. I'm going to wrap it up right here and, uh, and be done with this. Thanks a bunch for tuning in, everybody. Appreciate your time as always. And uh, we will be back on Friday for a regular show. I don't know yet what the topic's going to be, but tune in and you'll find out. If you haven't subscribed, make sure you subscribe, hit that thumbs up, and comment below. Tell me what you think. Tell me what's going on in your world of cameras. Tell me uh, tell me if you, you're getting a G9 or a GH5 or GH5S or any of these Lumix cameras. Tell me what you're buying. Tell me down below. I'd love to hear from you. Hear about it from you. Take care of yourselves, people. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.